Hello, this is Valdemar Janusczak, art critic, producer and presenter of documentaries. And thanks for watching Perspective, YouTube's home for classical art. English countryside is a deceptive terrain. It looks so sweet, so friendly, so innocent, but it's none of those things. Anyone who's listened to a few episodes of The Archers will already know that dark stuff happens in the English countryside. Sharp of tooth, red of claw, it's a deadly battleground. The great English painter Thomas Gainsborough certainly knew this. He was a country boy, born and bred, a Suffolk lad. Gainsborough recognised that beneath the deceptively innocent surfaces of outdoor England, unpleasantness was thriving. Lives were being ruined. Greed was being shown. Voila, Gainsborough's masterpiece of outdoor Englishness, his famous double portrait of Mr. and Mrs. Andrews. Summer corn glistening in the sun, fluffy clouds scudding across the sky, English oaks dotting the horizon, and sitting in front of it all like a pair of giant spiders in the middle of a web, Mr. and Mrs. Andrews. Him with his big gun and his nonchalance, she with the most puzzlingly unpleasant expression in the whole of Gainsborough's art. If this woman invited me up to spend the weekend at her big country house, I don't think I'd accept. Something's going on here. It's a pretty scene, it's Merry England, but something's going on here. This is Gainsborough's town, Sudbury in Suffolk, where Mr. Andrews and Gainsborough probably went to school together. It's a tea and cakes town these days, so we're ye olde on the tourist circuit. But when Gainsborough was born here in 1727, this was a real slab of rural England, a cloth town in serious decline. Daniel Defoe came and visited Sudbury quite early on in the century and thought that it was a very, very poor place and with one or two rich people and all the poor people may well eat the rich ones, he said. So it was quite a depressed town and Sudbury has always been an earthy little working town and its main industry has been weaving. Um, and indeed the Gainsborough family were concerned with that, not only Gainsborough's father but also his very much more successfully his uncle, but it was quite a shaky business, I think. They made velvet here. Wool, of course, Sudbury is surrounded by sheep, and, interestingly, silk. This is Gainsborough's garden, and this beautiful old survivor is a mulberry tree, planted here in 1610. It would have been handy for the Gainsboroughs to have a mulberry tree in the garden, because mulberry trees are what silkworms feed on, and the Gainsboroughs were in the cloth trade. Gainsborough's father, was a trader in fine materials. And so, in a way, was his son. If you ever get a chance to examine closely a portrait by Gainsborough in his prime, have a good look at the clothes they're wearing. The silks, the satins, the brocades, the lace. He had a genius for painting precious fabrics. He knew about them from birth, and loved them dizzily, I think. Picture after picture by Gainsborough at his best is a glorious advert for his father's calling. Even Mrs Andrews, the baddie in this picture, gets an outfit to die for. Pale blue silk in an outrageous expanse 
not what you'd usually wear if you're out killing pheasants. I get the feeling in a lot of Gainsborough's pictures that he liked the clothes more than he liked the people wearing them. He was notoriously unimpressed by his sitters. When he was painting Sarah Siddons, the most celebrated actress of her times, the Elizabeth Hurley of the Georgian age, he suddenly exploded, damn your nose, there's no end to it. And behind the backs of his sitters, he was even more scathing. Yes, he, he was known to complain about his sitters, um, but I think being a portraitist is really a considerable problem that you have all these people who by definition want to look better than they probably do. Um, and that, having that day in, day out of about eight people a day um, must be a considerable problem. And most portraitists got very, very bored um, with um, self-important people rushing through their studio all day. Gainsborough hated doing fashionable portraits. The cursed face business, he called it. His tragedy was he was so damn good at it. They only have one part worth looking at, said Gainsborough of the fashionable types he painted, and that is their purse. So he sniffed the air and headed for where the biggest purses were gathered. He moved to Bath, where all the celebrities of Georgian England would visit to take the waters and to have their likeness done by Thomas Gainsborough, the Mario Testino of his age. He ended up in London, naturally, the most fashionable portrait painter in England, who was usually forgiven his little rudenesses because he captured a likeness better than anyone else. He had the gift all right. Gainsborough had the fastest hands of any painter this country's ever produced. He painted like an expert swordsman. Whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. And the rich have always been able to take a bit of rudeness from their artists in return for some breathtaking immortality. He realised that he had to cover a vast amount of canvas in order to compete with people. There are one or two records of um, head and shoulder portraits which uh, he completed in one hour, 40 minutes, and that is going at sensational speed. There's records of him getting drunk for a fortnight and then doing a skirt of a great full-length portrait in a night. So uh, I think he used that speed to good effect so that he could get drunk for a fortnight and also um, so that he could get through the acreage of canvas and compete in a real way. Gainsborough was the youngest of nine children. His father, the cloth merchant, fell on hard times and was bankrupt. Young Thomas wasn't going to enter the cloth business. He had another talent, art. And according to a story, which I don't quite believe, but I'll tell you anyway, when he was a boy, he saw a man trying to steal pears from his garden and drew him so convincingly that the neighbours recognised this scoundrel immediately and nabbed him. Young Gainsborough was also naughty. Another story, which I do believe, is that he used to forge his own sick notes for school and captured his parents' handwriting perfectly. From his days of forging sick notes at school and throughout his life, Gainsborough was a subtle subversive, always doing things on the sly. At the age of 18, he got married, in secret, to the illegitimate daughter of a duke. He'd got her pregnant. She brought in 200 pounds a year, which was very useful, and which Gainsborough began to supplement busily by painting some of the most memorable portraits in British art. This is the house the Gainsboroughs lived in. It's an estate agent's now, and no one seems to know what went on in which room. But it could be that this is the spot in which Gainsborough painted Mr and Mrs Andrews. 
These days, the picture hangs in the National Gallery and is famous the world over as Gainsborough's earliest masterpiece. But until 50 years ago, no one outside the Andrews family even knew it existed. The National Gallery didn't buy it until 1960. So here's an interesting question. Why was this painting kept so secret for so long? Andrews inherited half of the estate from his father, Aubrey's it was called. His wife brought in the other half when they married in 1748. So although it wasn't, strictly speaking, a marriage of convenience, it was certainly a most convenient marriage, which left both of them twice as rich as they had been. So far, so normal. Here are two small town money bags celebrating the union of two big time purses. But something went wrong in the making of this much moneyed wedding portrait. I often watch people walking past this entertaining picture and enjoy it a lot. But it's amazing how often they miss two crucial things about it. One is how frightening Mrs. Andrews is, but the second is that it's unfinished. If you look closely at that brown splodge in the middle of her lap, something's missing. The picture is incomplete. Gainsborough never had his final say in this painting. He meant to show something here, but never did. What was it? And why did he never put it there? Why is Mr. and Mrs. Andrews unfinished? These are the questions that need to be asked. Here you have a painting that's famous the world over as the perfect image of rural England. But just as paradise had a snake in it, so Mrs. Andrews had on her lap something that never got painted, something that someone somewhere didn't want us to see. And I'm sure I know what it is. The single most aggressive and destructive act ever perpetrated by the government of Britain on its rural folk was the long and drawn out passing of the Enclosure Acts, which took the common land away from the people, put a fence around it and gave it to the landlords. It was unforgivable. It ruined the livings of so many country people. Gainsborough's heart always went out to them. The poor had his sympathy, not the rich and the landed, like Mr. and Mrs. Robert Andrews. This is the exact spot on which Gainsborough painted his wonderful picture. You must recognize that oak behind me, this big fat English oak which is exactly the same tree, although it's thicker now than it was before. And over there, of course, is that beautiful slab of the English countryside, which is behind Mr. and Mrs. Andrews in the picture. Still, I think, really recognisable. Now, Mr. Andrews is standing just about here. He's been out hunting, so he's holding his shooting rifle nonchalantly under his arm. Mrs. Andrews, she's sitting here, demurely, with her legs crossed. Now, I've seen this picture so many times in the National Gallery, but it wasn't until I came here and stood in this spot that I realised something incredibly interesting about it, which is that behind Gainsborough in the painting, hidden from sight, is the house in which Mr and Mrs Andrews actually lived. Now, that's significant, not just because you didn't know it was there in the painting, but also because it explains one of the great mysteries of Mr. and Mrs. Andrews, which is why she is dressed in this flamboyant outfit of flowing pale blue silk, while he is wearing his scruffy shooting gear. Obviously what's happened is that he's been out doing the shooting, while she has been waiting for him indoors and has now come out to meet him just a few hundred feet away from the house to sit on his bench. The biggest change in the landscape, of course, is this huge row of trees behind me. There's a forest down there now that isn't in the Gainsborough picture. Now, that was planted deliberately by one of the later owners of the house. Apparently, they built a council estate at the bottom of the hill. 
So the owner decided to try and mask it, and he planted this huge forest in between it and him. The corn's gone, of course, it's all been grassed over now, but if you look carefully, you can actually still see the echoes of these furrows. There's little bits of them left. And what's interesting about the furrows is that they're what's left over from this revolutionary new use of an implement called the seed drill. Now this seed drill was the very latest in agrarian technology. It made harvesting the corn so much easier. And Mr Andrews was very proud of being a pioneer in its use. The seed drill wasn't widely taken up initially. Wealthy landowners were keen to use it as it was a public demonstration of how wealthy and how advanced they were. It wasn't received widely uh, by the majority, especially the farm workers. In fact, they could see with this change, with mechanisation coming in, that actually their jobs would be at threat. Mr and Mrs Andrews, these newlyweds, are showing off the fruit of their union, their land and their agricultural progressiveness. Of course, there isn't a peasant in sight, and none of this was achieved by these two getting their hands dirty in any way. What the painting shows to me is the importance of the new farming methods to him, and there's a real statement that he's actually, you know, a very wealthy, powerful landowner and really accepting all these new ideas. And it's sort of really, look at me, I'm so, you know, really ahead of the game. People say that Gainsborough was having a go at the rural rich in this picture. I think that's right, he was. These are greedy people. They've snatched the land away from its rightful owners and they're parading themselves in front of it while Gainsborough disapproves. But there's something else going on here, something more personal. If Gainsborough really did go to school with Mr Andrews, I think he rather liked him. Mr Andrews is sympathetically painted. He's dim but nice, lounging around on his land with his gun and his dog. It's Mrs Andrews who worries me. She's surely one of the least attractive women in Gainsborough's art. Uptight, clenched, stiff. She's only a teenager, 18 years old, but she already has the demeanour of a middle-aged rural harridan. And what is that on her lap, that unfinished blob of canvas? I think there's only one thing it can be. That must be a feather, the tail feather of a cock pheasant, I warrant, and the rest of the bird is sitting on her knee. He's been out hunting, he's brought the bird back. She's got it on her lap, on a cloth, so that it doesn't bleed into her beautiful blue dress. But if that is a cock pheasant, what's it doing there? Is the dead bird an innocent avian corpse brought back from the morning's hunt and no more? Or does it have another meaning, a deeper one, a symbolic one? Gainsborough was a great admirer of Dutch art. And in Dutch art, you often find women, wenches, shop girls, wives, holding up dead birds, cocks, snipe, duck. Look at this buxom butcher's maid. How fiercely she clutches that cock. Look at her unsmiling determination. Does it remind you of anyone? The fact is that most dead birds in Dutch art represent a man who's fallen into the clutches of a determined woman and been plucked. The bird in the hand of a buxom Dutch woman is invariably intended as a warning to us guys not to let ourselves be grabbed where it hurts. And all the naughty double entends involving the word cock are entirely intentional. Gainsborough, a countryman, would have known all about these low country readings, and he would, I suggest, have been after just such a double entend in his picture before it was censored. I think that he didn't like Mrs Andrews much, that he was warning Mr Andrews of the fate of the cock pheasant that's fallen into her lap and been grabbed. Just before this picture was finished, I think its secret meaning was spotted. 
and that Mrs Andrews realised all too clearly how unflattering a portrait of her was being painted here. The picture was never finished because the sitters finally realised what Gainsborough was saying about them and didn't like it. Ah yes, the English countryside. The corn in the field, the larks in the sky, and the poison in the hearts of the people. Mr and Mrs Andrews is a great masterpiece of Gainsborough's early work, but if only he'd been allowed to complete it, it would have been greater still. There are a million stories in the world of art. This has been just one of them. Death. Most of us prefer to avert our eyes at the sight of it, but not artists, oh no. Artists enjoy picking over it. Death has been one of art's great subjects, and art's treatment of it has tended to separate the men from the boys, the great artists from the ordinary ones. Witness the fascination with death of Rembrandt van Ryan. Rembrandt seemed often to have death on his mind. His own, yes, in those doggedly pessimistic self-portraits, but also everyone else's. He painted plenty of the usual dead Christs, hauled up and down the cross like meat at a butcher's. And he painted meat at the butcher's, crucified like a Christ. You wouldn't want to be a bird in Rembrandt's presence, because he only looked at you properly when you were dead. From the beginning, he was haunted by the spectre of the end. Rembrandt produced a couple of the most brazen evocations of death in the whole of art. Above all, there's his strange painting in the beautiful Moritz House in The Hague, the anatomy lesson of Dr. Tulp. It's acknowledged as one of his most powerful works, and the moment you see it, you know you're in the presence of a most unusual masterpiece. Eight curious men, hunched eagerly around a corpse, like a gaggle of illegal gamblers on Tottenham Court Road, captivated by the three-card trick. Why would Rembrandt want to paint this? It's a dull title, isn't it? The Anatomy Lesson of Dr. Tulp. You imagine you're back at school, don't you? At a medical tutorial with a group of eager students keen to learn the secrets of the dissector's trade. But that's not what's going on here. Because the first thing to note about this eerie masterwork is that Rembrandt, in his quest for enigmatic silence, seems to have left out something crucial from this scene. Something very noisy. The audience. A baying crowd of boisterous Amsterdammers, two or three hundred strong, playing music, munching picnics, would have ringed this gory spectacle and watched the corpse's dismemberment cut by cut, slice by slice, with great enthusiasm. The public dissection at the time of the Renaissance were very popular. It was normal that when you got a new girlfriend that you wanted to marry, to give you a good present, you bought a ticket for the next public dissection to come. The anatomy lesson in reality attracted many viewers. You had to pay for each single visit, or you could pay uh, per corpse because the anatomy lesson lasted for three days or five days, depending on uh, what was there to be explained. In Holland in the 17th century, the Dutch,
quiet people, you would have thought. Sensible types, not known for their bloodlust or their necrophilia, developed an unprecedented passion for public dismemberment. The dissection of a cadaver, muscle by muscle, limb by limb, became a must-see event. We go to Cats and Starlight Express. The Dutch, in Rembrandt's day, queued for tickets to a corpse cutting. Well, the painting on the right is the very first painted anatomy lesson we know. Not only Amsterdam, not only Holland, but worldwide. It looks like a sort of festive banquet of civic guards, only the banquet has been replaced by a corpse. The painting on the left is the first anatomy lesson painted uh, where we don't look at a, an executed criminal's body, but uh, to a little child. This baby seems to be asleep, and it's also holding its own umbilical cord. Uh, like, uh, what a little child would do, of course not with the umbilical cord, but with your little finger, for instance. We're in Rembrandt's house in Amsterdam. This is his bedroom. This is his studio. And this is his prop room. Rembrandt's cabinet of curiosities. A collection of curios built up over the years to fire his imagination. In 1669, just before Rembrandt died, an antique dealer came up here hoping to buy the lot and discovered among the coral and the stuffed beasties, the seashells and the armor, four human arms and legs skinned and floating in glass jars. One of these arms may have served as a model for the anatomy lesson of Dr. Tulp. If it did, then Rembrandt had been hoarding it for 35 years. Leiden, not much of a town these days, but in Rembrandt's time, a hothouse of money-making and trade. The Van Ryans, named after the river flowing past their front door, a petite tributary of the giant Rhine, were millers, corn grinders to the populace. Rembrandt was born here, would you believe, in 1606, the eighth of nine children. Today, his hometown seems perversely determined to ignore him. They've put up a statue that pigeons poo on, and that's about it. All the sign there is in Leyden that Rembrandt's story started here. At 14, he was sent to university, but soon dropped out. He was going to be a painter, and a cocky painter at that, who outgrew Leiden quickly and moved, in 1631, to Amsterdam, where the money was the clients, the business, and where they commemorate him everywhere these days. And I mean everywhere. A few months after his arrival, out of the blue, young Rembrandt, the new artist in town, was commissioned to paint a picture by a desperately fashionable Amsterdam GP who called himself Dr. Nicholas Tulp. Dr. Tulp was a self-made man in every sense. Like Rembrandt, he'd come to Amsterdam from Leiden, where he'd studied medicine at the university. His real name was Klaas Peterson, but he changed it to Tulp when he got to Amsterdam. Tulp, in Dutch, means tulip. This was the era of tulip mania in Holland. The whole country had gone blooming mad. Tulip mania was the internet boom of its day. Ruthless garden millionaires, 
made their fortunes wheeling and dealing in rare varieties. A single precious bulb could fetch the same price as a house. There was a tulip carved into the gable of Tulp's new house in Amsterdam. So that's what he began calling himself as he did his rounds. Dr. Tulip, GP to the rich, driving around Amsterdam in a coach emblazoned with tulip designs. It obviously worked as a piece of rebranding, but how good a doctor was he? Well, one of Dr. Tulp's favorite prescriptions was to order his patients to drink 50 cups of tea a day. And if that's impressive medicine, then I'm a PG chimp. Tulp was a show-off, but that was just as well. A less flashy doctor would surely not have chosen the newest painter in town, a young gun called Rembrandt, just arrived from Leiden to capture for posterity his great Tulpian performance at a public anatomy lesson mounted in Amsterdam in the winter of 1632 by the Surgeon's Guild. The Surgeon's Guild consisted of surgeons, not doctors. Although in each painting there's always one doctor. He was an academically trained doctor and was appointed by the local government to do teaching of anatomy. The surgeons were organized in a guild and they were craftsmen, although they had a highly, high, uh, pretty high esteem of, the, of themselves. It sounds impressive, doesn't it? The Surgeons Guild. But the surgeons of Amsterdam had to share their guild with tripe producers, clog manufacturers and skate makers. So they relied on art to separate them from their tripe producing brothers and to endow them with the grandeur they felt they deserved. At least once a year, the guild had the right to organize an anatomy lesson. 200 or 300 people must have been present. But the painting, however, only depicts those who were ready to pay for their own portraits. We don't know exactly whether the doctor also painted for his own portrait, but it seems likely. It seems even more likely that the doctor took the initiative to commission the portrait, because it's striking that most of the anatomy lessons were commissioned uh, in or about the year that the doctor was appointed as the prelector of the Surgeon's Guild. So, Tulp made Rembrandt by choosing him, and Rembrandt responded in kind by immortalizing Tulp as the silent hero at the center of a tense and powerful medical drama. We watch ER starring George Clooney. The Dutch watched this starring Dr. Tulp. It's a strange pose. What's Tulp actually doing? Well, his right hand is probing the corpse's arm with some forceps, the skin already taken off, of course, while the other hand is going like that, like a priest blessing his congregation. What's actually happening is that Tulp is lifting a muscle called the flexor digitorum superficialis, located in the proximal interphalangeal joints. And this, as you know, operates the fingers. So with his left hand, he's showing what would happen to the fingers if you moved this muscle they'd go like that. The students lean over, fascinated, to see exactly what he means. But Tulp doesn't steal all the limelight here, does he? Much of the credit for the anatomy lesson's riveting presence is due to the deathly white corpse, glowing like ready break at the center of the action. Poor guy. All he'd done was try a bit of shoplifting, yet look where it got him. At the time of the Renaissance, it was very normal that normal people could enjoy looking what is beneath our skin. Something which is not normal today. Those 
anatomy artists who painted uh, this picture like Rembrandt, they would nowadays not be allowed. Today, no artist is allowed, whether in England or in Europe, to dissect a cadaver. I think it's a shame. The anatomical theaters between 1550 and uh, about 1850, all over Europe, including London, they were mainly small ones. They were usually out of wood, therefore many are not preserved, unfortunately also not in London. They were small because uh, when you want to see something a real life or a real death in this case, you must be very near to the dissection. The public dissection at the time of the Renaissance were really something. The anatomy lesson Rembrandt paints actually took place on January the 31st, 1632. The corpse belonged to one Adrian Adrianson, alias The Kid, a petty criminal who, like Rembrandt, like Dr. Tulp himself, came to Amsterdam from Leiden in search of richer pickings. He'd been caught stealing a coat, and earlier, on the very same day that Rembrandt paints, he'd been hanged from the gibbets on the waterfront, which seems a hell of a price to pay for stealing a coat. They were not the, the small criminals, they were really the big guys that, with a huge record of crime. This was just the last drop that did it. Though it records a real event, an actual anatomy lesson, the painting can't have been done right there, before the corpse, as it were. In a real anatomy class, the first thing you'd open up is the corpse's stomach. That's where the squishiest and smelliest human bits are housed. And with anatomy classes lasting a few days and no refrigeration at hand, the real Dr. Tulp would certainly not have started with his victim's arm he would have sliced straight into the guts. The great death of Adrian Adrianson made Rembrandt famous. As his celebrity grew, so did the size of his commissions. The grandest painter in Amsterdam no longer troubled himself with mere coat snatchers. He was painting Amsterdam's finest and he was packing them in. It wasn't until 20 years after the anatomy lesson of Dr. Tulp that Rembrandt returned to the dissecting chamber for a second dose of dismemberment. The anatomy lesson of Dr. Damon. A wonky painting that wasn't wonky once once, it too featured a large dissecting drama. But half of it was lost in a fire in 1723, including the head of Dr. Damon. You see the man standing behind the corpse, that's Dr. Damon without the head. He's the assistant to the prelector. I think he's the famous person without a head we know in Dutch art. The first time I saw the anatomy lesson of Dr. Damon, and I bet you thought this too, I mistook the two halves of the corpse's brain for long hair parted down the middle. The corpse looks just like a dead Christ, doesn't he? The top of his head, handed around like a cup, makes a passable chalice too. Something always nags me about the anatomy lesson of Dr. Tulp as well. The way those middle-aged students pour over the miraculously glowing corpse reminds me of the adoring shepherds who hurry to the stable in a nativity. What I'm saying is that Adrian Adrianson and Jesus Christ have had the differences between them deliberately blurred. The kid may have been a no-good coat-stealer who met a grim and pitiful death. 
but Rembrandt's given him a send-off worthy of a god. So the kid did well out of the picture, but what about everyone else? Well, Rembrandt himself, he fell out of fashion in his 40s, he was bankrupt in his 50s, and he died in Hock, age 63. Dr. Tulp prospered initially. He was the first doctor to describe the anatomy of a chimpanzee, and he went on to become mayor of Amsterdam four times. But just recently, he's been outed as a fraud in a clutch of revisionist medical books. His reputation is shot. His imitators mistrusted. The actual building in which the dissection took place, that dark hall looming up above them, is called the Varg these days, and it's a restaurant in the red light district of Amsterdam. But there's something we haven't tackled yet. Remember I said something seemed to be missing from this scene, something crucial, the audience. Well, look more closely. Follow Tulp's eyes. He's not looking at his students. He's looking out beyond them. Look at the man on Tulp's right. Who is he staring at? At us, of course. We can't see the missing audience because we are the missing audience. And that man at the top of the pile of students, the one pointing down at Adrian Adrianson's corpse, he's looking at us too. It isn't just the corpse he's pointing at. He's pointing to everybody's futures. There but for the grace of God go all of us, is this picture's hidden message. Thanks for the reminder, Rembrandt. There are a million stories in the world of art. This has been just one of them. There are paintings whose meaning is a mystery. There are painters who led mysterious lives. But only rarely, very rarely, do we encounter an utterly mysterious painting by an utterly mysterious painter. That's the case with The Tempest, the masterpiece by Giorgio de Castelfranco, better known to you and me as Giorgioni. Tempest hangs in the Academia Gallery in Venice, a city packed with great pictures. But so precious is the Tempest that they wouldn't even let us into the same room to film it. This is an icon of Western culture and is possibly the best conserved of Giorgione's works still in existence. Entire books have been written about the content of this painting which can be interpreted at various different levels. For 500 years, the Tempest has led its many admirers on a wild goose chase. To this day, there is no agreement about what we're actually witnessing when we look at it. Who is she? Who is he? What are they doing? And where are they? Although Giorgione is considered perhaps Venice's greatest painter, he wasn't actually from Venice. He came from the Venetian mainland, the Veneto as it's called, a land of dark hills, mysterious mists and silhouetted castles whose poetic presence always haunts the backgrounds of his art.
Castel Franco, where young Giorgio was born in 1477, is a pretty medieval city, surrounded by a moat. We know Giorgio came from a humble family, that he was tall and imposing, which is how he got his nickname, Giorgioni, Big George. Big George's earliest work in Castelfranco is now in ruins. It's a puzzling frieze of musical instruments and astronomical diagrams painted in the house of a local nobleman. Like so much of Giorgioni's art, the Castelfranco frieze seems to speak to us in riddles. At an early age, he left Castelfranco for Venice, where he quickly made his mark with these mysterious fantasies filled with poetic longing for the Veneto. But there's a problem. We know Giorgione's art was revolutionary, that he had many followers and was much copied, but we don't know exactly what he painted. None of his work is signed, not even The Tempest. Unlike other painters of uh, uh, Renaissance Italy, uh, very little is known about him, except for the, the, uh, the date of his death and a few dates of, uh, of, of some of, of his paintings. But uh, when we know the date, the painting is lost. And when we have the painting, we have no date. With one exception, there is only one painting in Vienna, Laura, which is dated on, on the back of it at 1506. So it's, uh, it's a very mysterious painter. We know almost nothing about Giorgione's life. We know that he lived in this square in Venice, that he played the lute beautifully, that he was very handsome, that women liked him, and that, perhaps as a result, he died young. It seems that his handsome looks and his beautiful lute playing brought him to the attention of a certain Venetian lady. She caught the plague. Giorgione, while conducting this illicit affair with her, caught it too. He died in 1510, aged a little over 30, but he'd done enough. He'd changed the course of art. Like no one before him, Giorgione was to feed the Venetian appetite for melancholy ambiguity. It's an appetite the inhabitants of Venice seem to inherit with their mother's milk. The city itself, a floating labyrinth decaying before our eyes, is a puzzle waiting to be solved. People like to look up when discovering the same place different things that they have possibly never seen before. This happens even to us Venetians. Whenever we look up or look around, we discover something new. We'd know more about Giorgione, a lot more, if what he painted on the outside of this unnaturally blank building hadn't crumbled into the water. This used to be the warehouse of the German merchants in Venice. Once it was completely covered with frescoes by Giorgione. Today, it's Venice's main post office. And only this tiny decayed fragment remains. The Tempest was painted just before Giorgione's horribly premature death in 1510. We know it was probably commissioned by Gabriele Vendramin, a member of one of Venice's most powerful families. This is Vendramin as an old man, painted by Titian, who was always thought to have been Giorgione's pupil. But notice the cross in this painting. It's terribly important. This cross, which still exists behind this golden door, was thought to contain a fragment of the actual cross on which Jesus was crucified. Yet one day, to the city's horror, it was dropped accidentally into this canal in Venice and sank to the bottom.
no one could find it, until Gabrielle's famed ancestor, Andrea van Dramin, plunged into the water and fished it out. It was a miracle, or so the Venetians believed. Their cross was safe. The miracle of the cross gave the Vendramin family great fame in Venice, though you wouldn't know it today. I tracked down the family palace and found it to be a simple hardware store. Looking around at the nuts and the bolts, it was impossible to imagine that in this building, Giorgione's Tempest was to hang, largely unseen, for 400 years. We don't know how Gabriel Vendramin came to acquire the Tempest. He probably commissioned it directly from the painter. 20 years after Giorgione's death, a visitor to Vendramin's palace remembers seeing a little landscape with a storm, with a gypsy and a soldier by Giorgio of Castelfranco. Already, the Tempest's real meaning was lost. So perhaps it never had one. Tempest is a very mysterious painting, and this is proved by the very fact that there are uh, 30 to 40 different interpretations of it. Uh, one of them being that it has no meaning at all. This is one interpretation like the others. From some contemporary sources, we gather that uh, the sort of patrons like Gabriele Vendramin, who owned the painting in, uh, in the 1520s, loved to have guests in their homes and to show them some paintings like this and, and, to, and, and to play with them whether they would understand or not. This is the reason why uh, many, many scholars, including myself, a uh, vast majority of scholars, including myself, believe that a meaning was intended. Whether we are able to understand it or not, but that the meaning was intended. Vendramin never sold the Tempest. He left a will forbidding his heirs from selling it too. For the next 300 years, hardly anyone saw it. One visitor to Venice who did was the poet Lord Byron. It became his favorite painting and obsessed him. Byron believed the Tempest was a portrait of Giorgione himself with his family. Tis but a portrait of his son and wife and self, he wrote. But Byron had a taste for other people's wives and he fell in love with the woman he took to be Giorgione's spouse. Such a woman, love in life, he drawled. In 1932, the Italian state finally bought the painting, and it's hung in the academia ever since, daring all comers to guess its true meaning. Interpreting the Tempest has become one of the great cottage industries of art history, but somewhere out there, there's a solution, and that solution must lie in the painting itself. Guess what? I think I've found it. So what do we see in The Tempest? The setting looks much like Castelfranco itself, underneath a stormy sky with lightning in it. There's a beautiful mother suckling a baby, and a most handsome young man, tall, finely dressed, who seems to be her partner. So was Byron right? Is this Giorgione and his family? No, it isn't. Although we know so little about Giorgione, we do amazingly know what he looked like. He painted a self-portrait in which he pretends to be King David slaying the giant Goliath. Not all the picture has survived, but the face that remains is clearly not the young man in the Tempest. So who is he? And was Byron right or wrong about what he said? The soldier is, in fact, a comrade of the sock. If you look at his socks, you will see that they are different colors. The comrades of the sock were private associations, very common in the Venice of that time, of young hedonists who got together to act plays, enjoy themselves, accompany wedding processions. But just because the chap in The Tempest is dressed as a fashionably louche Venetian, it doesn't mean that's what he represents. 
Venetian art liked to set things in the present, to take the Bible or the tales of the gods out of the distant past and make them real. Oh, how they liked their costumes, just as Byron does. Also hanging in the Academia is this huge masterpiece by one of Giorgione's descendants, Veronese. It's called The Feast in the House of Levi, and it too is a painting with a checkered history. The Feast in the House of Levi isn't its original name. Its first name was The Last Supper, and what it actually shows is the most famous dinner ever eaten. We don't recognize it these days because Christ and his disciples are wearing contemporary clothes and because many of the characters in the painting aren't really supposed to be there. There's no mention in the Bible of dwarfs and jesters attending the Last Supper. So could the Tempest, like Veronese's Feast at the House of Levi, be a secret religious painting? Professor Salvador Settis believes it is. What I did is basically to read all the literature on, uh, on the painting and to see what is meaningful in the painting and what is not, which means the, the man, the woman, the child, the columns which are there, a serpent which is uh, hidden uh, in a bush, the, the lightning in, in the sky, but since the lightning was uh, widely used as a symbol of God in uh, Giorgione's time, I assumed that there was an equivalence between God and the lightning. Uh, and it's a definite possibility that, this is, that, that, that actually the Tempest represents Adam and Eve with the first born child, Cain, actually. And the serpent would be an allusion to the original sin. So all, all different elements would be explained. But there's a major flaw in this surprising Adam and Eve theory. When the painting was cleaned, that serpent which Professor Settis claims to have located under this bush turned out to be nothing more than the root of a tree. Can this really be the Garden of Eden? I've looked at it on many occasions for many hours and never once felt any religious atmosphere. Over at the Academia, they prefer the simplest of all explanations. Which of the many interpretations of the Tempest's meaning do you think is probably closest to the truth? Nessuna. None of them. None of them, none of them. I like Michele's one best of all, a storm with a gypsy who is feeding her child and a shepherd. So everybody else has been wrong. I don't know. <laughs> if the painting isn't Giorgione's family, if it doesn't mean nothing at all, if it isn't a religious image, what can it be? Well, there is one area in which the artists of Venice specialised and took particular delight. The stories of the gods. Mythology. Above all, a lot of fun was had enjoying the antics of Zeus, the god of thunder, a master of disguise whose appetite for good-looking mortals was Clintonesquely insatiable. Here's Giorgione's pupil, Titian, showing Zeus disguised as a shower of gold coins, making love to the surprised Danae. Zeus had a different disguise for every affair. To seduce the nymph Callisto, he took the form of another woman, Diana the Huntress, a stimulating example of girl-on-girl -girl mythology. To make it with Io, he came down as a barely visible cloud of excitement And it wasn't just girls he went for. Attracted by young Ganymede, Zeus turned into an eagle and had his violent way with the boy. That lightning in the background of the Tempest must surely indicate the presence of Zeus, 
the god of thunder and thrower of lightning bolts. But he's not seducing the woman in the picture, is he? She seems to be the partner of the handsome young man. So what is Zeus doing here? After 500 years of mystery, I think I've cracked Giorgione's code. There is a story, and only one story, which fits snugly with what we see in The Tempest. It's outlined here by Homer in the Odyssey, the most celebrated of all classical poems. It concerns Demeter, the goddess of fertility, who made things grow. This is her with her clothes on, but I think Giorgione's painted her in the Tempest with her clothes off. According to Homer, Demeter met a handsome mortal at a wedding called Iasion. Even though she was a goddess and he was human, they made love in a ploughed field and had a baby. That baby was Plautus, the god of wealth. Zeus, Demeter's brother, and complicatedly her former lover, who often enjoyed the embrace of mortals himself, was so angered by this illicit relationship between Demeter and Iasion that he killed Iasion with a lightning bolt, smote him with his bright thunder, says Homer. The Tempest shows the moment just before Zeus's deadly revenge. That's why the atmosphere is so charged. Demeter has given birth to the god of wealth, but Iasion is about to be hit by a deadly thunderbolt. His crime? He was a mortal who made love to a god. And we're like the audience at a Christmas pantomime, who can see what's going to happen and who want to shout, look out, look out. Once you know the picture's overall meaning, every little detail falls into place. Demeter's unexpectedly blonde hair, there's not too many blondes in Venice, is described by Homer, who calls her fair-tressed Demeter, golden-haired Demeter. Poor Iasion has a broken column behind him. That's bad luck. Broken columns, even in cemeteries today, represent a life cut short. In classical art, Plautus, the god of wealth, was often shown as a baby boy in the arms of a woman. But the cleverest clue, so easy to overlook, is the mysterious white bird perched on the roof behind. One of Demeter's attributes, the things that appear in pictures next to her so you know it's her, is a crane. This beautiful white bird flies south in the spring to rear its young, so it represents fertility like her. But the crane has another role in mythology. It's renowned for standing on one leg, so during the Renaissance, they believed that in its other foot, it held a stone. And if it ever fell asleep, that stone would drop, hit it on the other leg and wake it up. And so the crane became a symbol of vigilance. Always look around you. Be prepared for what happens next. It's exactly the kind of message that a rich man like Gabriel Vendramin, whom Plautus has so favoured, would keep on the walls of his study as a constant reminder of the fickleness of wealth. Here today, gone tomorrow. The Tempest is a warning. Watch out, because you never know where or when the lightning may strike. It's a good message for Gabriel Vendramin. It's a good message for all of us. There are a million stories in the world of art. This has been just one of them.
scene in the first Bond movie, Doctor No, where a glistening Ursula Andress emerges from the sea in a skimpy bikini right in front of the excited Sean Connery. Of course you remember it. It's one of the most famous arrivals in the movies. Well, what you may not know is that the inventor of James Bond, Ian Fleming, had a particular Quattrocento painting in mind when he imagined this unforgettable scene. It's a revolutionary painting produced in Florence in about 1485 of another goddess coming out of the sea. Not a screen goddess this time, but an ancient Roman one. Botticelli's Venus. The most celebrated nude goddess in art. Her face instantly recognizable because this Venus has infiltrated popular consciousness to an unusually deep level. She's everywhere. But hold on a bit. Ursula Andress was meant to be sexy and stirring in that beefy Swiss way of hers. She was after big desires and sweaty passions. That's definitely not what Botticelli's Venus is trying to do. The Venus doesn't do sweatiness. She is to Ursula Andress what an orchid is to a T-bone steak. She's delicate, fragile, modest. And I've always thought there's something of the Lady Di about her. That shy tilt of the neck, the little look down, the fetching nervousness. But if Botticelli never had in mind the full-blooded arousal of all those who looked at his sensationally famous Venus arriving naked on the beach, which he didn't, what exactly was he after? The real trouble with the birth of Venus is that we just know it too well now. And so we have no way of trying to arrive back at the moment in art and in Western culture when it didn't exist. Because if we could get back to that moment, then we would understand in a very visceral as well as intellectual way what a revolutionary painting it was and in some ways still is. Botticelli's real name was Alessandro di Mariano di Vanni Filippi. He was born in Florence, where that house is behind me, in 1444, in the parish of All Saints, Ogni Santi. His father, a leather worker, was 50 when Sandro was born. His mother was well over 40. That's late, even by modern standards. In Renaissance times, it was asking for health troubles. Little Sandro was the Filippi's fourth son, the runt of his litter. All his life, people would say about him, Sandro bello e mal sacro. Sandro is handsome, but unhealthy. He was always pale, apparently, and don't you think that some of this inherent paleness found its way into his art? explanations for why Alessandro dei Filippi came to be called Botticelli. The more boring of the two is that Botticelli is a corruption of the word battigello, which means someone who beats gold. When Botticelli was a teenager, he was apprenticed to a Florentine goldsmith and may indeed have been just such a battigello or gold beater. His art always maintained a most fruitful relationship with gold. That's certainly true. Gold pops up in his paintings in lovely and interesting ways.
But the explanation which I prefer for the origin of the name Botticelli is that it comes from his elder brother Giovanni, a successful city banker who was notoriously fat and therefore nicknamed Botticella, which means a barrel or a tub. Thus his sickly younger brother became little barrel Botticelli. It could be true. What's sure is that when he was in his mid-teens, Little Barrel gave up goldsmithery and began his apprenticeship as a painter. And that delicacy of his, that slight sickliness which contemporaries remembered about him, gave him an advantage when it came to producing pictures of rare Florentine exquisiteness. Is there not something highly strung and frangible about all his art? As far as we can tell, these big Botticelli paintings were basically furniture paintings. It may seem uh, an odd way to regard them, these great, cherished, multi-million pound masterpieces, but they were part of interior decoration, high-minded interior decoration of people who were very educated. And these are elite pictures for a very small circle of people, and they certainly were not for public consumption. This is the street in which Botticelli lived and worked until his death, and behind me is the house in which he must have painted the birth of Venus. One of Botticelli's neighbours in this street gave his name to a country you may have heard of, America. He was Amerigo Vespucci, the great navigator. The Vespucci's were the richest and most powerful family in this locale, and Botticelli was soon working for them. In Italian, Vespa means wasp. That's why those annoying little scooters that buzz around Italian cities at night, right outside my hotel as a rule, are called Vespas. The wasp was the Vespucci family's symbol. See the wasps going into the hole in the tree there? They're an indication that this intriguing Botticelli was painted for the Vespucci family. And she's curious. She's one of the many women in Botticelli's art who at some point in their history have been identified as a portrait of Simonetta Vespucci. Simonetta was a much admired Florentine beauty who married into the Vespucci family. And there's a persistent rumor in art that she was also the model for Botticelli's Venus. But there's no evidence for this of any kind. In any case, Botticelli's women have a certain interchangeability to them, a group look. I really doubt whether this is Simonetta Vespucci. But what is intriguing is that this woman, although she's managed to hang on to all her clothes, is also a Venus. She's shown here with Mars, the god of war, whom she's tamed by exhausting him. How? Well, what do you think? Today, we all know Venus is the goddess of love. I'm your Venus, I'm your fire. What's your desire and all that? But that's not how she began. Originally, Venus was a minor Roman goddess charged with the safekeeping of town gardens and vineyards, the goddess of allotments, if you like. It was only when this minor horticultural deity of the Romans took on and absorbed the identity of Aphrodite, the Greek goddess of love, that she grew into the potent and popular mythological starlet so many have since desired. Botticelli's most significant patrons were not, in the end, the Vespucci, but an even wealthier and more powerful Florentine family, those fabulously potent Firenze bankers, the Medici, who essentially ruled the city. And this rather gloomy rural retreat was owned by one of the lesser Medici, Lorenzo de Pierfrancesco de Medici. Essentially, this was his summer house, 
And somewhere in here, we don't know where, Botticelli's Birth of Venus used to hang. We don't know how it got here, we don't know when it got here, and we're not sure why it got here, but we do know that it used to hang somewhere in this gloomy rural retreat, alongside yet another of Botticelli's remarkable love nest of Venuses. I hope you're feeling clever, because this painting takes a lot of keeping up with. It's called La Primavera, the spring, and it features Venus again. She's the one standing in the middle, rather quietly. But we know it's her because there's Cupid, her son, firing off arrows of love above her head. Over here, very important figure, because the picture really moves from this side to the other side. Over here, blowing out his cheeks, is Zephyr, the god of the west wind. Now, Zephyr is blowing away winter and therefore, as it were, ushering in the spring. And as you can see, he's chasing this nymph here. She's Chloris. Zephyr fell in love with Chloris, but Chloris wasn't interested. He took her anyway. And what's happening is that the act of taking Chloris results in her transformation because she changes into Flora, the goddess of spring. Venus, as we said, is in the middle with Cupid above her. And she's attended by her usual attendants, the Three Graces, joyously dancing. And over here, finally, is Mercury, waving his wand at the clouds to dispel them, and therefore preparing for the spring again. Now, he is probably a slightly disguised portrait of Lorenzo de' Medici, Lorenzo the Magnificent, as he was called. If it is him, he's the one who commissioned this picture, and if he commissioned it, he probably did it because one of his cousins, Lorenzo di Pierfrancesco de Medici, who lived in the Villa di Castello, was getting married. And this painting was meant to be an encouragement to him. And indeed, it was meant to provide advice about fertility and how to bring out the best in your bride. It could be that the bride was a touch reluctant, like Chloris, and that she had to be forced into the marriage. But even if she was, it results in all this. In this astonishing, blooming, wonderful, flower-filled spring. This is one of the world's greatest ever evocations of fertility. Remember, this used to hang, too, alongside the birth of Venus in the Villa de Castello. So are there any clues here to the kind of meaning we should be expecting from the birth of Venus? Of course there are. The Mona Lisa has mystery. The Venus de Milo has a great body. But Botticelli's Venus has the whole package. Mystery, a great body, hair that could drive a man wild with entanglement, and something else, an X Factor. I've been puzzling over what this X Factor might be for a couple of decades now, coming over to Florence, trying to work out why this particular woman toots so many people's horns. And I've come to believe that what gets us in the end is her vulnerability. Sure, all us guys want to jump into that picture with her and study some Latin, but we also want to protect her, to wrap that cloak about her. She's come out of her shell on this blustery day, so cold, so fragile, so hesitant, and she looks so exposed. She needs us. Botticelli's Venus makes us feel wanted. That amusing English poet, Alexander Pope, who was much taken with beautiful women, wrote once about a particularly gorgeous lady at court. Has she no faults, then? Somebody asks him in the poem. Yes, she has one, I must aver, replies Pope. When all the world conspires to praise her, the woman's deaf and does not hear. Doesn't that remind you of Botticelli's Venus? She's outrageously beautiful. 
yet so embroiled is she in her own thoughts that she appears to be deaf to our praises and can't even hear our tongues hitting the tabletop at the sight of her. When you first look at her, you think she's beautiful. But when you actually study her, there are two particular things that are sort of wrong with her. It is to do with her left shoulder. If you think about it and actually study the painting, her left shoulder is uncomfortably low. I'll do this Quasimodo in interpretation. You can see it actually sort of does that down there. But the neck and the shoulder together do look slightly strange when your eye concentrates upon them. Um, and for me, the strange bit is looking at her foot as it stands on the shell, where there's a sort of bump in that way that slightly old ladies get bumps when they try and put their slightly large feet into small shoes. And my eye is often drawn to that. And, and then I think, oh, I forgive him. She's been on the shell a long time. And you know, maybe she's got cramp or whatever. But funnily enough, it's not an anatomically beautiful body, but it is um, an aesthetically incredibly pleasing one. She was painted in around 1485. Maybe for Lorenzo di Pierfrancesco again. What is obvious is that this modesty she has, that shyness, the Lady Di look, is definitely intentional. We know this because her pose is based directly on a Roman statue owned by the Medici, the so-called Venus Pudica, or Modest Venus. This Roman Venus covers herself up and hides her bits. She symbolises the sort of modesty that Florentines demanded of their women, particularly when they entered into marriage. So, although Botticelli's Venus is naked, indeed, she's the first great mythological nude of the Renaissance, and she's nearly life-sized to boot, despite all that, the effect Botticelli wanted to convey with her was surely one of modesty, not of exposure. Though I don't think Botticelli's birth of Venus is meant to be erotic, there is no doubt that she does open the door in Western art to the nude as carnal. And you only have to go 50 years down the line to Titian painting the Venus of Urbino, where you have a beautiful naked woman lying on a couch, incredibly aware of her own erotic teasing and sort of saying, I am available sexually. And there begins such a great and terrible history of Western art and the female nude, which is about men looking at her and her needing to be desired. Now, I don't think Botticelli did that with Venus. I think that face still has the self-containment of the knowledge of some spirituality to it. But certainly, once the cat is out of the bag, once the clothes are off the body, you can't control where it goes. This is Hesiod's Theogony. It's the classical text that most clearly describes the birth of Venus. It's a hell of a story, blood-curdling. Uranus, the god of the sky, was being a beast to his mother and lover, Gaia, the Earth. So Gaia persuaded their son, Kronos, a titan, to sneak up on Uranus while he was making love to Gaia and to cut off his testicles. Kronos then chucked these genitals into the sea. He lopped them off with the flint and threw them from the mainland into the great wash of the seawater, and they drifted a while on the open sea and there spread into a circle of white foam. And from this circle of white foam grew a girl, Venus, or Aphrodite as she was first called. Thus Venus was the nautical fruit of Uranus's frothing testicles. Now unless my eyes are failing me completely, none of this bears any relation to anything we can see in the Botticelli. We've got a naked Venus in a shell, the shell's in the sea, and she's surrounded by a cluster of mythological figures. But surely no one here is being born. No frothing, no castration, no testicles. 
Yet if this isn't the birth of Venus, as we've been misinformed for hundreds of years, what else could it be? Let's have a close look at all this nature on show here, this excellent horticulture. There's plenty of it, and it's all meaningful. This little plant here between her legs, that's an anemone, a lovely spring favourite, which, according to legend, only grows when there's a warm wind. So the ancients used to call it the windflower. And lo and behold, up here in the corner is our old friend Zephyr, bringer of the warm wind and an inveterate blower. Zephyr isn't only blowing the anemone to life, look at all those roses pouring out of his mouth as well. The rose is specifically Venus's flower. The ancients believed that it only came into being at a very important moment, the first time Venus set foot on dry land. We've got the land here all right. These are orange trees, the ancient symbols of the Medici. And this figure here, she's probably one of the Hore, the embodiments of the seasons. She's the Hore of spring, I warrant. Look at these gorgeous cornflowers painted on her dress. And see here, she's wearing a girdle of roses. The Hore is handing a cloak to Venus so that the modest Venus can cover herself. So what does it all mean? Well, it means that the painting seems to celebrate an important arrival, an arrival that brings fertility. Is it therefore another marriage painting, joyously commissioned to celebrate the arrival in the Medici family of another fertile bride? I think so. But that's conjecture. What's certain is that this isn't the birth of Venus, it's her disembarkation. She's arrived somewhere on her shell, and when she touches the land, it blooms. What could this be, then? Well, I think it's in here again. Hesiod's Theogony. Having been born of Uranus's testicles and drifted across the sea, Venus made her way to sea-washed Cyprus and stepped ashore, a modest, lovely goddess, and about her slender feet, the grass grew. So, the painting we've been calling The Birth of Venus ought properly to be called Venus, having been born of Uranus's testicles, arrives in Cyprus and makes things grow. But for some reason, that title never caught on. There are a million stories in the world of art. This has been just one of them. Dragon. He's from Australia. He's an innocent little beast. He sits there in the sand and hunts flies. I think he's gorgeous. But he and his kind have had a tough time of it in art. Their behaviour misunderstood, their appearance mocked, their reputations blackened. Art's been nasty to lizards and perhaps the most unfortunate of the many unfortunate lizards scattered about art's darkest corners is the one who's been forced into playing a leading role in Caravaggio's early masterpiece, that exceptionally puzzling meeting of human and reptilian ambition, boy bitten by a lizard. Why would a lizard bite this boy? Who is he? What does it all mean? And why has Caravaggio bothered to paint it? These are tricky questions, and unfortunately, 
We can't answer them here, in this delightful reptilian company. No, we have to go somewhere dangerous and edgy, somewhere murderous and anxious. We have to go somewhere where even the lizards keep out of sight. We have to go to Rome. Even today, you have to keep your wits about you in Rome. Watch your back, watch your money, watch your girl. But back in 1592, it was much, much worse. The mean streets of Rome were a notoriously dangerous terrain. Thieves, gypsies, vagabonds, brigands on the run, prostitutes on the make, taverns full of card sharps and pickpockets, out-of-work soldiers looking for action. It was violent, horrid, scary. No place, certainly, for a sensitive young soul. So it's a good job Caravaggio wasn't one of those. Caravaggio was from Milan. His proper name was Michelangelo Merisi, but he grew up just east of Milan in the small town of Caravaggio. So that's what they began calling him. When he fetched up in Rome in 1592, he was fatherless, motherless, penniless, hungry, angry, and very difficult. Oh, so difficult. Caravaggio had trained as a painter in Milan, but that meant nothing here. Rome in the 1590s was already packed with painters on the make. From all over Italy they flocked, hungry for work, desperate to succeed. Every one of them looking for a gimmick in their art, a twist, something that made them stand out. Caravaggio lived in ten different places in his first year in Rome. Ten! It was a restless, fraught, uncomfortable life. Because if you were at the bottom of the artistic heap, as he was, unnoticed, with no reputation, then the only way to make a living was out here in the streets. Hawking your art in the markets, selling it to passers-by for a pittance. His first biographer complains that he was churning out heads for a groat apiece. He'd do three of them in a day. Now, I don't know how much a groat is worth, but it can't be much. One of the first pictures we know that Caravaggio sold somewhere out here, for a few groats, perhaps, showed a boy with a flower in his hair being bitten by a lizard. A most unusual subject. What could it possibly mean? Caravaggio's real teacher was out here, the street. There's a famous story, which I don't think is true, but which must have been invented for a reason, of someone showing him a statue by the great Greek Phidias and asking him what he could learn from it. Nothing, replied Caravaggio, ignoring the statue and turning instead to the people in the street. Nature, he said, is my only teacher. What's certainly true is that Caravaggio had begun putting outrageously real people into his pictures. Characters from the street. The gypsies who told your fortune and stole your money. The roustabouts from the tavern. Soldiers, drinkers, card sharps, hustlers people who'd lived. They're Sid Jameses and Judy Denches, rather than Brad Pitts and Cameron Diaz's. And among this fabulous cast of character actors, the swarthy and worried face of Caravaggio himself began popping up in the action. All these hustlers and artists who'd slunk into Rome looking for work were desperate to find someone rich and powerful enough to take them under their wing and protect them. Caravaggio found just such a sugar daddy right under his nose, a few hundred yards away from where he was flogging his pictures in the streets, Cardinal Francesco Maria del Monte. Del Monte was immensely cultured and kindly. He had a particular passion for music and collected castratos as well as painters. Caravaggio painted an exquisite series of musicians for Del Monte. 
with carefully observed musical instruments that would have come from the Cardinal's own collection. Now, music has always played a very ambiguous role in art. It was Shakespeare who said, if music be the food of love, play on. And music has always stood for a pleasure, a wonderful moment in life that happens but then passes. And the message of that painting produced for Cardinal Del Monte is that life is short, but death that follows it is eternal. It must have been Del Monte who got Caravaggio, his most prestigious commission so far, here in the church of San Luigi dei Francesi, the French church, just two minutes away from Del Monte's palazzo. The first of these was unveiled in 1600. These are the paintings that made Caravaggio famous. And you can see why straight away. No one else had ever made religious art like this before. Usually, the stories of the Bible are set out there somewhere, in the clouds, in the distance. But this, this looks like an eyewitness account from someone who was actually there. This is St. Matthew being chosen by Jesus. Matthew was a tax collector, but Jesus has tracked him down to this gloomy tavern and reminded him of his vocation. The most sensational thing about this picture is that it's set in a simple Roman tavern of the kind that Caravaggio and his cronies used to frequent. The Inn of the Blackamoor, the Inn of the Wolf, they're all around here. And the characters in the picture, they're Caravaggio's buddies too. Street types, tavern goers. They had no business being in a Bible painting but because they are there, they make it feel so terribly real. On the other side of the chapel, we see the other end of Matthew's story, his martyrdom. He's in a Roman bathhouse being murdered. But can you see that face illuminated in the darkness at the back, the one with the haunted, sweaty expression? That's Caravaggio himself, putting himself into his own picture as he was wont to do. With Caravaggio, the action always feels personal. He knew about violence, he knew about street fights, and soon he would know about murder too. I won't bore you with all the police records relating to the young Caravaggio in Rome. If I had to provide you with a full list of his misdemeanors, we'd be here all night. He was constantly in trouble with the police, getting into fights, insulting passers-by, owing people money, stabbing people, being stabbed himself. This was an unusually cussed personality. Caravaggio was fond of wearing his sword in the street, which was illegal and fond of pulling it out when anyone said anything to him, which was even more illegal. And all this violent foreplay came to a head in May 1606 in this street, when two gangs of armed men confronted each other just here. The leader of one of the gangs was Ranuzio Tommasoni, a bellicose man about the taverns who liked to fight. The other gang was led by Caravaggio, Ranuzio and Caravaggio had apparently quarrelled over a tennis match and now they went head to head in a thuggish street squabble with swords which Caravaggio won by slashing Ranuzio to death when he was down. Thus Caravaggio became the only great artist ever to commit murder. What a grim claim to fame. Police never caught him, though. He fled from Rome and never came back. There was still great art in him, lots of it, but from now on, it was painted on the move.
The murder brought him even greater notoriety. People began to hunt about for his earlier works, the stuff he'd hawked in the streets, those heads he'd churned out in threes for a groter time. Among these was a most mysterious painting of a boy being bitten by a lizard. And the question began to be asked, what did it really mean? Let's take a closer look at this picture. It's so interesting, what's going on in there? A lizard's been skulking about among the fruit and the flowers. The boy put his finger in there and the lizard bit him. The boy's wearing an off-the-shoulder tunic and there's a rose in his hair. The sheer effeminacy of his outfit identifies him as Bacchus, the Roman god of wine and pleasure, who's often shown as a very girlish boy because Bacchus was the naughtiest of the Roman gods. He drank too much. His followers were notorious for their debauched behaviour, their drunken orgies. Caravaggio painted a number of these Bacchuses, and what an anxious, unhealthy and pale bunch they are. I've always been terribly fond of this great Bacchus that hangs in the Uffizi. It's the most decadent of all of them, and that's saying something because Caravaggio's Bacchuses are a most decadent lot. What I love about this painting, if you look closely, is that all its subtle meaning is conveyed in the details. Look, for instance, at that glass of wine he's holding in his hand. Look at its surface. Can you see those carefully painted little ripples? What can that possibly mean? I'll tell you what it means. He's had too much wine the night before. He's woken up and his hand is shaking. And everything here underlines this basic message that too much wine, too much of anything, too much of any good thing is bad for you. These Bacchuses have always been some of Caravaggio's most mysterious pictures. Painted in Rome in the 1590s for Cardinal Del Monte, they've always been fiercely misunderstood. In particular, people have been interested to find out whether they are all self-portraits or not. In the old days, Art historians were agreed. They looked at these dark faces with their arched eyebrows and those puffy little mouths of theirs, and they said, these are all Caravaggio himself. Well, maybe, but what's undoubtedly true is that even if these are not specifically self-portraits, they are evocations of himself, pictures in which his spirit plays the leading role. And in a couple of cases, I'm sure it's him. How do you think an artist trying to produce a face like that would have proceeded? I'll tell you how he would have proceeded. He would have got himself a mirror, looked at himself in that mirror, made that fierce expression, and then painted it. This, surely, is Caravaggio himself. Whenever I look at Boy Bitten by a Lizard, which is as often as I can, I get the feeling that Caravaggio has set out deliberately to pull me into the picture. It's just you and the boy in the dark, a one-to-one -one drama. He's so close, so touchable, just an arm's length away. If you look at something like The Boy with a the Lizard, there's a petulance about the, the way he starts back that makes you feel as a very spoilt person, um, somebody not used to coping with the difficult things. Um, it's not a sympathetic face at all. Uh, and I think that's also part of the interest, that you, you wonder really what on earth this boy was doing. Um, and I think, I don't think I'm the only person that feels it's, I mean, he probably deserved this comeuppance. In the vase in front of the boy, there's a rose, and there's another one in his hair. Now you know about roses. You've bought them at your florist. They're so gorgeous in the shop, the queen of flowers. And then you bring them home 
and they wilt. Two days in the vase and they're kaput. Caravaggio's beautiful rose has a gorgeousness that's so short-lived. The vase is glass, expensive stuff in Caravaggio's day, precious, fragile. You spend all this money on it, yet look how easily it breaks. Here today, gone tomorrow. There's a lovely reflection in the vase of a window. The thing about reflections is that they're fragile too. The sun goes behind a cloud and they disappear. The rose, the glass, the reflection, they're all short-lived, temporary, just like that, and they're gone. A bit like life, you might say. One minute, you're a young boy who loves to party, and I speak here from personal experience, and the next, you're a clapped-out old man. But what about the lizard? What's he doing in the picture? Indeed, what's he doing in all the many pictures in which he appears? Have you ever bought a new car, gone out on the motorway with it, and suddenly realised that everybody else seems to be driving one? It certainly happened to me, and it's an illusion, of course. All it really means is that you've noticed it for the first time. Now, the lizard in art is rather like that. Once you've found one in a picture, they seem to pop up everywhere. The best place to look for them is at the bottoms of still lives, around the foot of the vase, on the top of the table. Here's a good example of just one of those situations. This is a painting by one of Caravaggio's more mysterious contemporaries. He's known only as the Hartford Master. It's an absolute treasure trove of vegetable painting. And that's what you see, first of all, when you look at it. But then look more carefully, right in the middle, skulking about again in the darkness, a pair of lizards locked in gladiatorial combat. So what are these lizards doing there, skulking about in the darkness of so many still-life paintings? Well, they're echoes of the most famous of all the biblical stories, the story about man's expulsion from paradise. If you remember, Adam and Eve were thrown out of paradise because they listened to Satan's temptation and did things they shouldn't have done. Satan came down to Eve as a snake. Well, in Caravaggio's times, the snake has become a lizard. If you look at the boy with the lizard, most people looking at that picture would actually feel that you know, the lizard was a great deal less evil than the boy. I mean, most of us think are on the side of the lizard in this one, <laughs> um, which is quite an odd achievement. Um, and that's clever about Caravaggio, that he takes this convention of man and snake, which I mean, from the earliest myths is about evil and sex, and turns it all round and leaves you very uncertain about what you think about it all. But there's something else we need to examine. The actual finger that's being bitten by the lizard. Does this finger have any particular meaning? The middle finger is our prime insult today, and it was referred to by the Romans as digitus impudicus, the impudent finger. Of all the Italian gestures that we study, what we discover is that this gesture, the digitus impudicus, is probably the most ancient of them all. When we curl the other fingers back in order to emphasize the middle digit, everything else curls back and looks rather like a scrotum. So it's, it's prime candidate for any kind of emasculatory phallic gesture. So and, to substitute the penis in that sense? Oh, very much so, absolutely. Today, it's a rather emasculatory gesture. It says, look what I'm going to do to you. And it can be used playfully. In the ancient world, that wasn't the case. It was extremely serious, and it was used in a slightly different fashion. This is how it was done, palm down, and it was a way of saying, see that person there? I'm not pointing at them with my index finger to indicate who they are. I'm telling you that they have a homosexual inclination. It's a gay gesture. That person there is homosexual. Caravaggio and homosexuality is a wasp's nest, and I'm steering clear of it. 
but whichever side of the court this boy plays from, his finger has certainly strayed and been bitten as a result. The message is obvious. Watch out where you stick, your digitus impudicus, because this is a painting about temptation. It's a painting that sets out to remind us of the brevity of sensual pleasure. Look how quickly it fades, like the flower, like the reflection, like youth itself. But there's one more thing we need to think about that's crucial. OK, Boy Bitten by a Lizard is a warning about the transience of earthly pleasures, a reminder of the shortness of life. It's all of those things. But here in Rome, where it was painted, that message has a particular pertinence. Here in Rome, wherever you turn a corner, you encounter irrefutable evidence of how quickly good fortune can fade. Caravaggio could have painted any young man having his finger bitten and made the same point about the passing of youth. But he deliberately painted Bacchus, the Roman god of wine, who drank too much and lived too fast. Why? Well, look around you here. This is what became of the Roman Empire when decadence set in. Caravaggio's picture was a warning to his own times. This is what happens to you if you don't watch it. There are a million stories in the world of art. This has been just one of them. if you've read this. It's in all the bestseller lists. Don't bother if you haven't. It's so silly. It starts with someone being killed in one of the corridors here at the Louvre in Paris. This chap is the keeper of an ancient secret, and if he dies, the ancient secret dies with him. So he crawls along the long corridor and seeks out the most famous painting in the Louvre. And there, he scrawls a secret message on the glass that protects the Mona Lisa. Now, the Mona Lisa has long been a magnet for mystery addicts and fruitcakes. You want mysteries? She's got loads of them. The mystery of her elusive identity, the mystery of her elusive smile. It's even been said she's a projected self-portrait of Leonardo as a cross-dresser. Even her eyebrows are mysterious. Why hasn't she got any? But there is one mystery concerning the Mona Lisa that can actually be solved, and we're going to do it in this film. It's perhaps the deepest mystery of all, and that is why, out of all the countless old masters gathered in all our museums, why did this particular one become the most famous painting in the world? Now that's a mystery worth solving. The Mona Lisa is 500 years old. She was painted in Florence in around 1503. In Paris, they've recently been celebrating her birthday. 500 years old. It's a good age. But the first thing to grasp about the Mona Lisa's ridiculous fame is that it's rather new. For 300 years after she was painted, the Mona Lisa was almost entirely unknown. Just a handful of people in history had ever seen her or even heard of her. She only started to become famous about 150 years ago, and really, really famous, this famous, in the 20th century. So her fame is rather new. So, by the way, is the fame of her creator, 
Leonardo da Vinci. Today we think of Leonardo as the greatest genius of the Renaissance. Scientist, mathematician, anatomist. The man who not only painted the Mona Lisa, but who also invented flying machines, submarines and bicycles. And it's just not true. I'm not saying that Leonardo didn't vaguely imagine some of those things, but I am saying that he never actually built any of them. Leonardo almost discovered lots of things, but only almost. His tragedy is that he never went the final mile, the bit that counts. Well, Leonardo was not that celebrated. Uh, um, one of the problem is that Leonardo did not paint very much, whereas Raphael was on the production line, one after the other. Um, Michelangelo the, did the whole ceiling, after all, and walls of the Sistine Chapel, I mean, a you know, huge project, in four years, which is what apparently uh, you know, it took uh, Leonardo to paint you know, this tiny portrait. Um, um, so if you wanted a, you know, lots of work, you were not going to ask him. You know that famous drawing that people always say is him? The old man with the big biblical beard and the all-seeing eyes. Well, there's no actual evidence. It's Leonardo, just our wishful thinking. Because this old man with the big beard reminds us of some great biblical leader, doesn't he? Moses, perhaps, or even God. So the next thing to get clear in our minds is that Leonardo da Vinci is chiefly, like this, a work of fiction. And before we tiptoe any further into the conceptual quagmire that is the mystery of the Mona Lisa, I think we need to find out a tad more about the real Leonardo. Olives. They're everywhere on this hill. In fact, just about the only thing that's up here is olive groves. We're about two kilometres out of Vinci, little Tuscan town of Vinci, a place called Anchiano. About 20 miles out of Florence. And this simple little Tuscan hill house is the house in which Leonardo da Vinci was born in 1452. His father was a notary, a lawyer, called Sir Piero da Vinci, and his mother, all we know about her, is that she was called Caterina, and Leonardo was their illegitimate son. Leonardo's father bought this house from the friars that used to own it. He was working for them as a lawyer, and it's hardly changed since then. It's just... Two very basic little rooms, really. Lovingly preserved in their original state of decrepitude. But look at this. Just above the window on the front. A lion wearing a helmet. That's the coat of arms of the Da Vinci family. Original fireplace. Leonardo, ghastly likeness, I think. Coat of arms again. It's a rather spooky feeling, actually. It's such a humble place for such a big brain to have been born. Leonardo's artistic career is so frustrating. He's always starting things and never finishing them. He spent the first 30 years of his life in Florence, yet all he had to show for all this time was a couple of pictures. One of them is this gorgeous portrait of Ginevra de Benci. She's rather glum. Why? In Italian, Ginevra means juniper, so the halo of juniper around her head is a coded clue to her identity. From the start, Leonardo could make his women feel mysterious. Here's an early Madonna and child that hangs in the Hermitage in Russia. What a ghastly, multi-pounded Jesus. 
Look at the size of him. I don't like her expression either. It looks forced to me. Say cheese. Cheese. These early experiments with different women's expressions had such mixed results that Leonardo soon settled on one he knew he could rely on, an expression he always used. You know it already. It's that mysterious smile playing on a woman's lips. Whether they're the Virgin Mary or a girl off the street, Leonardo began giving his women the same look. The Mona Lisa's mysterious smile was an expression he was churning out. For the next 20 years, Leonardo worked in Milan as the in-house genius for the local Dukes, starting lots of things, finishing none of them, except this. The Last Supper, the famous masterpiece that's been falling off the wall ever since he painted it, because the technique he used was so lousy. After 20 years in Milan, he returned to Florence. He was already in his 50s when a commission came his way that would finally lead to his most famous achievement. A portrait of a plumpish Florentine merchant's wife named Lisa Gerardini. There are lots of extraordinary surprises in the story of the Mona Lisa, but perhaps the earliest of them is that that story begins here, in this grim little Florentine street called the Via della Stufa. Now, this is the street in which Lisa Gerardini, who is traditionally thought to have been the Florentine lady who posed for the Mona Lisa, actually lived. She was married to a Florentine cloth merchant called Francesco del Giaconde, and that explains why in France she's known as La Giaconde, why in Italy they call her La Giaconda, and why, rather confusingly, the rest of us call her Mona Lisa, Madonna Lisa. It's what everybody would have said to her. Madonna Lisa becomes Mona Lisa. Thus, in this grim little Florentine street, populated these days chiefly by Florentine lowlife, the great legend of the Mona Lisa was born. For some reason, Leonardo never handed over the Mona Lisa to Francisco del Giacondo and his wife, probably because he never considered her finished. He was such a fiddler. Leonardo's career was now on the slide. In Italy, he was out of fashion, and his reputation for not finishing things preceded him wherever he wandered. Internationally, what fame he had was due entirely to his much-copied comic grotesques of ugly old men and big-nosed Jews. They're rather racist, really. It was the French king, Francois I, who saved Leonardo by taking him in when no one else would have him. Francois invited the 64-year-old multitasker to work for him in France in this chateau at Amboise on the Loire. Leonardo brought the Mona Lisa with him and no doubt fiddled with her some more. When he died here, three years later, in 1519, the Mona Lisa entered the French royal collection and, to all intents and purposes, disappeared for 300 years. And then uh, the uh, uh, first great break for uh, the Mona Lisa, the first great career move, as I would uh, put it, uh, um, the French Revolution. Um, what, what the French Revolution does, apart from minor things like abolishing the monarchy and, and so on, is to transform the Louvre into a museum. So at least she's now gone from, you know, semi-obscurity to a proper, uh, proper place. Another thing is Napoleon. Napoleon took a shine to many women, and one of these was uh, Mona Lisa. And indeed, for, I think, four years, the Mona Lisa was removed from public viewing and was in Napoleon's bedroom. Um, and then it was put back in uh, the Louvre. Um, and has remained there ever, ever since. 
You know, before Napoleon carried the Mona Lisa away to his bedroom, hardly anyone had seen her, and no one thought of her as this figure of mystery and allure. She was a portrait by Leonardo, and that's it. But now that she was in the Louvre, and the Louvre was open to the public, she was ready to fall into the clutches of the public imagination. And so her ludicrous journey to global fame could finally begin. Hang on to your hats, because we're taking you on it. When we left you, the Mona Lisa had just got to the Louvre and people could finally see what she looked like. They liked what they saw, but had trouble agreeing on what it was. Then, as now, everyone found something different in the Mona Lisa. In the middle of the 19th century, some intellectuals and writers begin to discuss the Mona Lisa as uh, the most formidable uh, example of the femme fatale. This is when the smile becomes mysterious and enigmatic. There is no mention of an enigmatic smile with, uh, with the Mona Lisa. I mean, basically, until about 1850, Mona Lisa is a cheerful housewife. From 1850 onwards, she is a castrating female. You won't believe some of the silly things that began to be written about her by the feverish blokes of the 19th century. Let me read you something here. It's perhaps the most famous passage ever written about the Mona Lisa by an eccentric English epicurean called Walter Pater, who was obsessed with her. She is older than the rocks among which she sits, he gushed in 1873. Like the vampire, she's been dead many times and learned the secrets of the grave and been a diver in deep seas. It just goes on and on. I mean, this isn't art history. This is stalking. The Mona Lisa had begun to drive men mad. Thus, the Mona Lisa entered the creative imagination of the 19th century, where she would have stayed famous among writers and art critics, and that's about it. If something else hadn't happened, something sensational, something that turned her into a public celebrity. Well, of course, you needed an event, you needed a photo opportunity, and that um, occurred in the shape of an Italian workman, um, Vincenzo Perugia, who um, stole the painting uh, in August uh, 1911 and kept it for two years in his bedsit, not far from the Louvre, near the stove. The Mona Lisa is a piece of wood, so you can imagine the possibility, the terrible possibilities. And that made uh, the world press. Every day, for three, four weeks, uh, there was something about uh, the Mona Lisa, the police can't find it, the security of the Louvre is terrible, the uh, director of the Department of Painting said to resign. You know, it, was, it became a sort of co-celeb, so people could see the Mona Lisa nearly every day as they were having their breakfast. So why would anyone be so stupid as to steal the Mona Lisa? Various conspiracy theories were aired at the time, and indeed, people have been airing them ever since. The likeliest answer is that the entire mad plot was the handiwork of an Argentinian forger called Eduardo de Valfierno. Valfierno's crazy idea was to produce a handful, perhaps six or seven copies of the Mona Lisa while he had it in his hands, and then to sell these copies on to some very, very gullible American millionaires. Now, this has never been proved. What's certain is that if you were a very gullible American millionaire, you would hardly have popped up afterwards and said, yes, I bought one of these. And undoubtedly, there were these very special copies floating around the European art world after the theft. However, once Valfierno had done his dirty deed and produced his copies, he no longer had any real need for the painting itself. So he handed it back to his accomplice, Perugia, and Perugia was stuck with the Mona Lisa, a painting that the whole world was looking for. What was he going to do with it?
Perugia must have realised that the painting was far too hot to do anything with in France. So he came back here to Italy and he holed up in this hotel in Florence, which used to be called the Tripoli Italia, but which, not surprisingly, has now changed its name to the Gioconda. Because it's in this hotel that the great lost painting was finally found. Perugia contacted a Florentine antique dealer called Alfredo Gerry and offered to sell him the Mona Lisa for half a million lira. Inevitably, Gerry contacted the Italian police. Three days later, they came here to the hotel and arrested Vincenzo Perugia. When they got inside Perugia's room, they found the Mona Lisa tucked away in a suitcase underneath his bed. And when they asked him why he'd stolen her, Perugia replied that it was an act of patriotism all along. All he'd ever really wanted to do was to ensure that the great Florentine beauty was returned to her rightful home. Perugia was sent down for a year for stealing the Mona Lisa, which doesn't seem very much, does it? But one thing's certain, no matter how famous the Mona Lisa was, before Perugia and his cronies stole her from the Louvre, his prior fame was as nothing compared with the enormous global notoriety that the picture acquired once all those newspapers and all those columns had stopped writing about the great theft of the Mona Lisa. And so our plump Florentine housewife finally became an international celebrity at the age of 400. Because of the robbery, everyone now knew what she looked like and everyone wanted to know more about her. In 1919, the notorious Dada artist, Marcel Duchamp, proved she'd really arrived by taking the mickey out of her, giving her a moustache and a goatee, and adding the letters Elage or Orcu, in French, a naughty pun, which means she's got a hot ass, or as we might perhaps say today, a hot booty. There is not any single moment where the Mona Lisa becomes the world's most famous painting. There are building blocks, there are stepping stones. So being in Paris is an important thing. Being painted by Renaissance genius is quite important. Being a femme fatale or being described as a castrating woman uh, um, would do you no harm. Being stolen was a great stroke of luck. Being mocked by futurist and avant-garde artist was also very important and being regularly exploited by the advertising industry in order to sell everything uh, from uh, um, fridge magnets, uh, hotels, uh, um, flights, uh, um, and condoms even. Um, you know, all that uh, is, is a tremendous asset uh, for, um, for a girl. I can't face going into detail about the subsequent growth of the Mona Lisa tat industry. It's too horrible to witness. Instead, let's just visit the house of the world's biggest hoarder of Mona Lisa memorabilia and savor some of the highlights of his collection. Bonjour. Entrez dans la maison des Jocondes. My house has become somewhat of a Mona Lisa museum, a shrine, if you like. I have gathered together some of the most beautiful items I have in my collection like this wonderful photo mosaic here, although the reflection is a bit irritating. These magnificent cushions. These ceramic tiles from China. And this is American. It's called the Giggling Mona Lisa. And this Persian rug. It's a bit amateurish, but still, it's magnificent. And this is something I made myself. It's based on William Tell, but as you can see, the arrow has missed its target. Once you're famous for being famous, all you can really do is become more famous still. It's the golden rule of modern celebrity. And the case of Lisa Gerardini proves it so clearly. So that's cleared up the mystery of how the Mona Lisa got famous. What it doesn't explain is how she ever managed to be obscure in the first place. How can a painting as wonderful as this ever be obscure?
Go on, forget everything you've ever heard about her. Forget the teacups and the posters. Just go and look at her properly. You'll enjoy it. There are a million stories in the world of art. This has been just one of them. was such an important year in the history of the world. In America, where the Civil War was raging, slavery was abolished, and President Abraham Lincoln promised his country government of the people, by the people, for the people. In England, the first underground line was opened between Paddington and Farringdon. In Switzerland, the Red Cross was founded, and here in France this went on show and caused the biggest scandal the world of art had ever witnessed. Idiotic, wretched, shocking, incoherent, childish, raged the papers of the day, taking huge offence at Manet's déjeuner sur l'herbe, the picnic on the grass. They didn't like the nude, they didn't like the men, they didn't like the colour scheme, they didn't like the composition. What upset them most, though, was this provocative way in which the men in this picture were dressed, but she wasn't. Not only was this woman flagrantly naked, but worse, she didn't give a damn. No, she just looked right back at her audience with that extraordinary stare of hers and dared them to disapprove. It was almost as if she was accusing them. Our own Dante Gabriel Rossetti, the Pre-Raphaelite, would later write a horrified letter home about this French idiot named Manet, who must be the greatest and most uncritical ass who ever lived. <sighs> Nasty. They were all wrong, of course. People invariably are when they get all worked up about an artwork. But very few pictures can claim to have changed the course of art single-handedly. This, however, is one of them. I'll just spell it out for you. Without this picture, there wouldn't have been Impressionism. And without Impressionism, there wouldn't have been modern art. And we'll talk about all that, what Manny was trying to do here, what he achieved, why this thing had the impact it did. But on a more personal note, can I also question the eyesight of all those critics who, in 1863, found this woman ugly? who complained about her figure and laughed at her. Were they all blind? This woman isn't ugly. This is one of the most desirable and alluring women in art. And when Manet found her, his art found a raison d'etre. Here she is. And her again. Was she? You'll find out. The thing that that uh, bothered people uh, with the déjeuner, I think, I think, I mean, from all this distance, is the look of that woman. There she sat on the lawn uh, with these men in their, you know, student garb. Um, young men, and uh, she could care less. It was outrageous. I think, I think that must have driven people, men who wrote about her, crazy.
Manet was the son of a very rich and very prominent French judge. Auguste Manet, he was called. He was a holder of the Légion d'honneur, and here at the Palais de Justice, Manet Senior was at the top of the judge's tree and held one of the most important legal positions in France. His mother was a genuine blue blood. Her godfather was the King of Sweden, and in fact the current kings of Sweden are all descended from him. So with a father who presided over the Palais de Justice and a mother mixed up with royalty, Manet came from an unusually distinguished family. He was the eldest son, born in 1832, and as so often happened in such situations, his father hoped he'd continue the family tradition and become a lawyer, while Edouard himself dreamt of the opposite. He dreamt of becoming an artist. With Manet more than with most artists, the choice between respectability and rebellion was so very loaded. Manet chose rebellion. He signed up as an apprentice in the studio of a flashy and immensely popular academic painter called Thomas Couture, a peddler of huge, fleshy, pompous fantasies packed with ancient nudes. This one shows the day after the night before at a Roman orgy. It's soft porn done with oil paints. But because the girls were dressed, or rather undressed, as Romans, Couture was forgiven. In Manet's world, this was acceptable. But this was shocking. The Dejeuner sur Lab is just frankly provocative. It was obviously completely immoral for a modern dressed woman to be seating naked with two fully clothed men. If you had river gods and nymphs and so on, of course that was absolutely fine, but not people who were absolutely, obviously, explicitly contemporary in their clothes. Rather surprisingly, Manet's father accepted his son's decision to become an artist and generously provided the money for Manet's upkeep and education. It can't have been easy for August Manet to sponsor and fund his son's rebellion, and it certainly wasn't in character. So let me plant some seeds of suspicion here about his reasons for doing it. Perhaps August Manet wasn't as respectable as he pretended to be. Perhaps Edouard knew something about his father that the father didn't want others to know. Perhaps Manet Jr. had something on Manet Senior. This is Manet's wife, Suzanne Lehnhoff. When Manet was a teenager, this Suzanne, who was from Holland, joined the family as a piano teacher. She gave piano lessons to Manet and his brothers. Now, something very mysterious happened with Suzanne because in 1852, she gave birth to a baby. And this baby, a boy called Leon, went on to appear in many of Manet's pictures. And because Manet eventually married Suzanne 10 years later, it's always been assumed that Leon was Manet's son. But what if he wasn't? What if someone else were the father? What if someone else made Suzanne Lehnhoff pregnant? What disgrace this would have brought to the family if it had come out? Who among the Manets needed most to preserve an aura of respectability around himself? A lot of very convincing circumstantial evidence points to August Manet being the father of little Leon and not Edouard. And if he was, as I believe he was, then the painting of Dejeuner sur Lèbe, begun in the year of August Manet's death, would have been informed by a highly personal understanding of the shallowness of respectability and the power of lust and the prevalence of hypocrisy. Oh yes, I'm going to tell you everything that went into the making of this picture, but some of it 
you may not want to know. First thing to note about Dejeuner sur l'air is that the scene Manet's showing us is actually illegal. Men and women weren't allowed to bathe together in Manet's time, and they certainly weren't allowed to go naked in public. When they did go bathing in the river, they wore very proper swimming costumes and were separated by big wire fences. So everyone seeing Dejeuner would have known immediately that Manet was deliberately teasing the law, mocking it. And the person who would have known this more clearly than anyone else, had he still been alive to see it, would have been Manet's father. The most obviously and outrageously illegal participant in this outdoor orgy, which is what people would have thought they were looking at, was that wonderful nude who sits there on the left and stares out at us so implacably. I've already admitted how much I personally admire, oh, OK, I fancy, the naked woman in Dejeuner sur l'Herbe. Well, her name was Victorine Morand, and her story is fascinating. Victorine Morand was born in Paris, and uh, she lived uh, in a working-class neighbourhood. I can't imagine her uh, just being a model. I think that uh, the passivity of modelling is not something that suits or goes with the, the look of that woman. Some dreadful stories exist of uh, Victorine. People seeing her outside the World's Fair, begging for money or being drunk. Uh, for, for me, that was always a reading. You know how th these people knew her as Manet's model, which is fairly close to being a prostitute. And so then when they see her again, they read all of that into it and have her dead at, you know, uh, 50, practically. So when we learn that she was a painter and exhibited at the Salon, and uh, even late in, in her 80s, when asked by someone doing a census what she did, and she identified herself as an artist, I think it was a vision she had of herself. So in a way, her life... I don't know, I suppose you could say her life was ordinary, but I, I find it rather extraordinary that, first of all, that this working-class girl could have ever imagined herself an artist. How did she ever get the idea that that's what she could do? I love her for that. I do, I just love her. <laughs> Manet was supposed to have met Victorine at the Palais de Justice, where his father presided over the courts. Manet Senior's task was to rule on domestic affairs, patrimony suits, affairs of illegitimacy and inheritance. Victorine was a part-time model and a street singer, so she was exactly typical of the kind of women who were always being brought before Manet Senior, accused of enticing this man or that man. So there's a perfectly reasonable chance that Manet met Victorine while she was appearing before his father on some misdemeanour or other. What a splendid irony that is. I definitely think there was chemistry of a sexual kind between uh, Miron and Manet. Even if she were gay, which I think she was, He talks about going to a party and, uh, you know, Victorine being there with her girlfriend and uh, their arms around each other and so on. So, whereas I never used to think of the two of them uh, sexually engaged, I think they could have been sexually engaged without ever having sex, let me put it that way. It's inevitably been whispered that Manet fell in love with Victorine and certainly her looks did something to him as they do to me. He painted her obsessively and gloriously for a decade. Here she is in a matador's costume Manet had made specially for him by a Spanish tailor in Paris.
This is her as a street singer leaving work. And here as a lady of the night who's just said goodbye to her respectable and two-faced Parisian lover. How do we know he's respectable and two-faced? Because, brilliantly, Manet's given Victorine a monocle to brandish. It can't be her monocle. Women didn't wear them. Old men whose eyesight was going wore monocles. Old men whose eyesight was going kept mistresses on the side. They sent posies of flowers to indicate they were coming. They feigned respectability in the daytime and then searched out what they really wanted at night. This is Manet's other famously scandalous picture. Olympia, she's called. It's Victorine again, so lovely, so brazen. What's happening in this picture is that Olympia, a courtesan, is greeting her next client, me, or you, or whoever's looking at the picture, because we've just arrived and we've brought her a bouquet of flowers. Just look at the expression on Victorine's face. What thoughtfulness, what sadness, what pity. And here's an interesting detail. See this bracelet. It's apparently a bracelet that Manet gave to his wife and inside it was a lock of his hair. Now what to make of that? I'm not sure but I think it underlines how Manet's art becomes extra personal in matters of sexual desire and respectability and the keeping of mistresses. And I think we have to bear that in mind when we go outside again and take a closer look at Déjeuner sur l'herbe. There was a lot of anxiety about the morality of women in Paris in the 1860s. What people were most afraid of was the sense that you couldn't tell who people were. You couldn't tell the difference between respectable people and non-respectable people. So all the way there was a sense that you couldn't read modern woman. So here's Victorine Mouron, naked, brazen, a biche, a lorette, a prostitute. And opposite her, lounging about, is Manet's brother, Gustave, who's playing an art student in the picture. We know he's supposed to be an art student because he's wearing a silly hat, a type of indoor fez much favoured by students. The second man is Manet's brother-in-law, Ferdinand Lehnhoff, the brother of Suzanne Lehnhoff. Ferdinand was a sculptor, so these are real-life artistic types pretending to be fictional artistic types and flouting the law orgiastically in a studenty way. The question is, why? Manet's told us that the original inspiration for the Déjeuner was a terribly famous painting that hangs in the Louvre of a concert champêtre, an outdoor music party involving a pair of costumed musicians and a pair of naked muses. In Manet's time, the painter of this old masterish Ménage à Quatre was believed to be the great Giorgione. More recently, Titian is said to have done it. Whichever of the two it was, the mood is luxurious, sensual, Venetian and very decadent. Two men who are dressed frolic with two muses who aren't. Not surprisingly, this great painting has set many French imaginations racing. The actual composition of Déjeuner sur l'herbe was based on a print by Marcantonio Raimondi of Raphael's Judgment of Paradise. So Manet's deliberately misquoting the old masters, taking on Raphael, taking on Giorgione, revisiting their scenarios and updating them. 
Déjeuner sur l'herbe, shows us what Giorgione's concert champette would have looked like if it had taken place by the Seine in 1863, rather than somewhere golden in Arcadia in the 16th century. It would have looked ridiculous, uncomfortable and illegal. Thus, this naughty painting is an outrageous updating of the past, filled with deliberate shocks. For instance, what is that woman at the back actually doing? In Giorgione's concert Champetre, she's a lovely mythological muse, drawing a carafe of water from a sacred well. In Manet's painting, she's become a woman in a shift who's waded into the river and who cups the water with her hand. Now, I don't know if you've ever been on a beach with some French women. If you have, you'll know that they keep running into the water to have a pee. It's an unfortunate national habit. For the French, the entire Mediterranean is a giant outdoor bidet. And anyone looking at Manet's painting in the 19th century would have realised that Giorgione's water-bearing muse has become a woman having a pee. This deliberate sacrilege continues all around the picture. Look how sloppily the remains of the picnic have been dumped on the grass. See in the corner, there's a frog skulking in the grass. A frog, gone we in French, was student slang for a prostitute. So this picture hasn't just set out to update one of the great themes of the old masters, the outdoor concert. It's set out to have a laugh at the old master's expense, to rub our noses in the absurdity of what the old masters showed us. Look up there in the middle. Can you see it? It's something people usually miss. It's a bullfinch, a common bird of the parks, yet look how uncommonly it's flying here, with its wings stretched out like that, flying over the centre of the composition. There's only one other bird in art that flies like that, right there in the middle, the sacred dove that represents the Holy Ghost in so many Renaissance baptisms. So we have here a flying bullfinch replacing the Holy Ghost and coming down to a woman having a pee. This isn't just a deliberately shocking picture, it's also a deliberately sacrilegious one, a picture hell-bent on transgression by an artist who's lost his submissive respect for the past and who's deliberately elbowing the old masters out of the frame and replacing them with the harsh truths of the modern world. It takes great arrogance to paint a picture like this. It takes chutzpah and Frenchness. But above all, I suggest, it takes an intense sense of personal disappointment, of being let down by the past, of no longer believing in a world you thought you could trust. And Manet had good reason to feel like that. to find stolen paintings. Don't go looking in the houses of robbers and burglars. Go to a museum. Here at the National Gallery in London, for instance, there's a very, very famous painting that shouldn't really be here because, to put it bluntly, it was nicked. But 
The National Gallery acquired the so-called Arnolfini marriage in 1842 from a Scottish soldier who'd fought in the Peninsular War in Spain. Before the Peninsular War, the painting belonged to the Spanish royal family. After the Peninsular War, it belonged to the Scottish soldier. You work it out. This is war booty. And if I were a member of the Spanish royal family, I'd be on the phone every day asking for it back. Because not only is this one of the world's most famous pictures, it's also one of the most gloriously mysterious. What exactly is it that Jan van Eyck has painted here? Something meaningful is obviously going on, but what can it be? Art historians have tied themselves into knots trying to unravel the mystery. Round and round and round they go. There have been hundreds of interpretations, but so successfully has this masterpiece of puzzlement confused its interpreters that the most fashionable theory currently doing the rounds is that there is no mystery to it, that it's just a portrait of Mr and Mrs Arnold Feeney, and that's it. That's what it says here, the National Gallery's own catalogue. No secret setup, no mystery, no hidden meaning. But that has to be wrong. The Arnolfini marriage must have a hidden meaning. The picture's packed with symbolism, and frankly, you'd have to be blind not to notice it. Look, for instance, at this fruit here on the windowsill. It says in the catalogue that the fruit is only here to indicate that the man in the picture is wealthy. He's a rich merchant, and rich merchants flaunt their wealth by leaving oranges, which were expensive, scattered casually about the room. What poppycock. All you have to do to see that this fruit must have some deeper symbolic meaning is to look at other pictures by Jan van Eyck. Look what's on the windowsill of this Madonna and child from Frankfurt. Is she trying to show how rich she is? Look at the windowsill of the Ince Hall Madonna. Why would this Virgin Mary be flaunting her wealth? She isn't. In Van Eyck's Madonnas, the fruit arranged so pointedly on the windowsill is a deliberate reminder of those notorious biblical events in the Garden of Eden that led to us being thrown out of paradise. When Adam took a bite out of the fruit being proffered to him by Eve, he committed the first sin and ensured the fall of man. The fruit on the windowsills of Van Eyck's Madonnas reminds us of the consequences of our inability to resist temptation. There's also a tree full of cherries visible through the window of the Arnolfini's room, and that isn't accidental either. Cherries were the traditional fruits of paradise. They represented what we've lost, what we could have had. That's why the infant Jesus is brandishing handfuls of cherries at us enthusiastically in the recently rediscovered Madonna of the Cherries by Jus van Cleve. The baby Jesus has come down to earth to atone for our sins by dying for us. And because of his ultimate sacrifice, it'll be cherries all round for us again in heaven. My point is that these cherries in the Arnolfini's garden and the fruit arranged so pointedly on the Arnolfini's windowsill is there for a reason. Everything in this busy painting is there for a reason. So let's be braver than the cataloguers of the National Gallery. Let's take the difficult path, not the easy one, and have another go at cracking the code of the Arnolfini marriage.
Not much is known about the painter Jan van Eyck. We know that he worked for the Dukes of Burgundy in the 1420s, travelled here and there, and ended up in Bruges as the city's greatest artist. Bruges today is the premier tourist destination in Belgium, and one of the best preserved medieval cities in Europe. But in Van Eyck's time here, the 1430s, this delightfully preserved chocolate box town was the most important trading port in Northern Europe. Bruges was international, busy and very, very rich. In the 1430s, Bruges must have been a very cosmopolitan place. Goods were transported from all over Europe and uh, found their way here from the Baltic region and further out east came, for instance, uh, furs and all sorts of uh, animal skins. From uh, the Mediterranean came things like uh, spices, uh, exotic foods, um, but also uh, textile. And textile was the main business of Bruges. Among all these precious stuffs being exported from Bruges all around Europe, perhaps the most valuable of all in the long run was oil paints, which were said to have been invented here by Van Eyck himself. It wasn't true, of course. Oil painting developed gradually in various places, but it is true that Van Eyck was the first great master of the new medium, and this made him internationally famous. that this is his self-portrait, and I believe it. This is a man who knows what he wants. The thing about oil paints is that they could achieve amazingly convincing, illusionistic effects. Painters could paint things with them that looked miraculously real, and no one was better at this than Jan van Eyck. One of the reasons this stubbornly mysterious picture has proved so enduringly fascinating is because Van Eyck involves you in the action so cunningly. At the front of the picture, the mysterious couple seem to be greeting you, as if you've just entered the room and they've been waiting for you. At the back of the picture, the famous wall mirror, so perfectly painted, not only shows the back of the couple, as you'd expect, but also two more figures entering the room. It's been said that the first of these is Van Eyck himself, but surely it must also represent whoever's looking at the picture, whoever's just stepped into the room. In other words, you. we can confidently identify the two people in the painting as Mr and Mrs Arnold Feeney. Their names appear in a couple of early documents, misspelt but still recognisable. The Arnold Feeney were a family of Italian merchants from Lucca in Tuscany who settled in Bruges and traded in precious materials, fabrics, silks and gold. Van Eyck painted the distinctive man in the picture twice. And for a long time, he was thought to be Giovanni di Arrigo Arnolfini. But recent research has suggested it may actually have been his cousin, Giovanni di Nicolao Arnolfini, who arrived in Bruges in 1419. We know that this Giovanni di Nicolao was married. We also know that his wife died. Giovanni was conspicuously prosperous, and in Bruges, in the 1430s, a huge proportion of a man's wealth was tied up in his clothes. Well, he's wearing a fur-lined velvet garment known at the time as a hauk, and it seems to be made of purple crimson velvet, which would make it extraordinarily expensive. Um, but her dress, the white fur, 
if indeed, as has been suspected, that the fur is the fur of the squirrel, then it's only the belly fur. And you're talking literally hundreds, if not thousands, of animals going into one of those gowns alone. And they were environmental disaster areas from our point of view. And by the end of the 15th century, the fur trade in Europe seems to more or less have wiped out the local wildlife, and they were very lucky to find the new world to go and exploit. <laughs> So the Arnold Theanies are dressed up to the nines in their finest finery. Why would that be? It was an art historian called Erwin Panofsky who came up with a theory in the 1930s that what Van Eyck is actually showing us is the Arnold Theanies' marriage. Panofsky claimed that Van Eyck himself and the other chap you see reflected miraculously in the mirror were the two witnesses at the wedding and that the picture was actually intended as a legal document. Which is why it sports that huge rumpold of the Bailey signature at its centre. Jan van Eyck was here. Unfortunately, to arrive at this fabulous theory, Panofsky needed to twist around some of the evidence and in a couple of instances actually make stuff up. And I reckon that today's fashion for insisting that the painting is nothing more than a portrait of a rich Flemish merchant and his wife is an embarrassed reaction by modern art historians to Panofsky's creative tinkering with the facts. But in dismissing all of Panofsky's theories about the Arnolfini marriage, are we perhaps chucking out the baby with the bathwater? Indeed, isn't the issue of the baby the first thing that needs to be considered here? And don't tell me that there isn't a baby. It says here, Mrs. Arnold Feeney isn't pregnant. It says here that this lovely bulge in her stomach is just the way her dress was cut, a fashion of the times. Well, I don't buy that. And I don't believe that anyone looking at her with genuinely open eyes can miss this protective gesture of hers. She's pregnant, all right, and this pregnancy is the key to the picture's meaning. Pregnancy is such a critical and ubiquitous human condition that you'd have expected art to be packed with images of pregnant women. After all, what could be a more important family event to celebrate and record than the expected arrival of a new baby? And indeed, there are lots of pregnant women in art. Rather amazingly, however, they tend to get overlooked. I don't think I've puzzled over any picture as much as I've puzzled over the so-called Arnolfini marriage. It's a maddening thing. It sends you all over the place looking for clues. And one day, by chance, it sent me here to the huge and grand Metropolitan Museum in New York. I was walking through this room and I saw this. You want evidence of pregnancy this is evidence of pregnancy. It's by Jus van Cleve, who worked in Antwerp, so close to Bruges. This is van Cleve's Annunciation. The angel Gabriel has come to tell Mary that she's about to become the mother of Jesus Christ. What a big moment. Isn't this space familiar? Isn't the bed familiar? Aren't those candles familiar? Isn't the window familiar? Isn't the mood familiar? This Annunciation bears such an obvious and tangible resemblance to the Arnolfini marriage that it might almost be the same setup. You encounter the same arrangement in other heartfelt Annunciations by artists who followed Van Eyck. A similar room, a similar bed, a similar atmosphere of a proclaimed baby. 
of course, the Arnolfini marriage doesn't show the angel Gabriel coming down to the Virgin Mary and telling her she's about to have Jesus. But look at this. It's just too similar to be a coincidence. Van Eyck's masterpiece is trying to plunge us into atmospheres exactly like these, the warm and holy atmospheres of an impending birth. So I've come up with a blunt and honest and no-nonsense title for Van Eyck's oh-so-complicated masterpiece. Let's get to the point here. We should call this the Arnolfini Pregnancy. This is a selection of portraits by Marcus Giretz the Younger, who worked in England in the late 1500s, but whose father was an immigrant from Bruges. It's only recently been noticed that all the women in these portraits are pregnant. Why was Marcus Giretz the Younger commissioned to paint all these pregnant women? Because birth in Giretz's day was an event brimming over with fatal significance. Pregnancy was something not only to be celebrated, but also to be feared. There was a perception that the mortality rate in childbirth was much higher, and women approached childbirth, some, with a lot of anxiety. You know, you would, uh, it would be a period, pregnancy would be a period in which you would do spiritual exercises. You would be thinking about the possible, strong possibility of dying in childbirth. So it made me think that that might be an aspect of the, of the portraits. If the woman died in childbirth, there would be a record, an image of her. It would take its place in the family portrait gallery. Thus, life and death are intertwined in the pregnancy portraits of Marcus Giretz, as they must somehow be intertwined in the Arnolfini marriage. A brave, free-thinking art historian thinks she's found the answer. Many people challenge the suggestion that the woman is actually pregnant because of a painting by Van Eyck which showed St. Catherine of Alexandria, who's obviously a virgin saint, in a similar dress and pose. And therefore, it was argued that it was impossible that um, a person could be shown in that uh, same pose and dress and necessarily be pregnant. On the other hand, St. Catherine of Alexandria was mystically married to Christ. And so therefore, um, it does actually make sense that they could, if, if not literally pregnant, perhaps a suggestion of pregnancy is intended. There was a discovery uh, in the archives in Florence, which is a letter from Mrs. Arnolfini's mother. And in this letter she mentions, and it's dated 1433, the year before this picture is dated, she mentions that her daughter Costanza had died. I decided that it might be possible to think of it another way, which is that this woman in the picture was actually uh, portrayed posthumously. That is to say that she's actually dead by the time the painting is, is completed. And uh, at first it seems very far-fetched, but in fact when looking at a lot of the details in the painting, I think that uh, it's very convincing that this was in fact the case. So I would argue that it's very likely Mrs. Arnolfini died in childbirth. Um, and there are other reasons to think that. Behind her, over her right shoulder, um, you can see the back of a chair which has uh, the image of a Saint Margaret praying uh, behind the dragon, which is her attribute. Saint Margaret was the patron saint of pregnant women. The uh, scenes around the convex mirror are illustrations of the passion, which seems very uh, interesting in terms of the division of Mr. Arnolfini and Mrs. Arnolfini, that is, the dead scenes on her side, the living scenes on his. Similarly, if you look at the um, chandelier up above, there is again a contrast of the lit candle still on the left side where Arnolfini is, and on the right, his wife stands underneath a candle that's gone out. 
I would argue that in light of this idea that she, this is a posthumous image of uh, Mrs. Arnolfini, certain um, aspects of the painting that were mysterious seem much more straightforward. So Mrs. Arnolfini may have died in childbirth, and Mr. Arnolfini may have chosen to memorialize her in this poignant masterpiece by Jan van Eyck. Arnolfini presents his wife to us with that touching gesture of his, as if she were still alive. Why does he do that? Because I think the painting is trying to understand her death and the baby's death in intensely religious terms by comparing their sacrifice with the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus Christ crucified on the cross up here in the mirror, right in the middle of the picture. fruit in the window reminds us of those regrettable events in the Garden of Eden that brought death into the world and robbed us all of eternal life. And see these funny shoes, patterns they're called, they're for wearing outdoors, you slip them over your other shoes. Well, Mr Arnolfini has discarded his so very pointedly. Despite what's happened to him, he has no plans to wander further. He's promising his fidelity to his wife and to his faith. And Van Eyck, because he was a genius, manages to indicate all this with oodles of clever symbolism. But he also captures the haunting self-absorption and all that repressed sadness and even anger in the face of Mr. Arnolfini. There are a million stories in the world of art. This has been just one of them. <laughs>